Matt Schaub held my balls for a while. He held them well, and the two of us had a chance to become part of a legendary gif in the Georgia Dome on December 18, 2006, until I screwed it up and everything went horribly wrong. The plan was to light imaginary cigars and salute the crowd with a flick of the imaginary ashes, but after becoming the leading scorer in the history of the NFL, I clearly lost my mind. <laughs> And this is where I need help from my teammate who saw things more clearly than I did. And hopefully he can lend some perspective on the post-kick celebration that took place. Matt, welcome to Great Day Nation. And can, can you enlighten our listeners and me, really? What, what happened next then? You know what? I think there was a brief blackout moment. For all of us, we knew what we, we, it was an extra point. It was a foregone conclusion. It was going right. through. But so, I mean, we were thinking, all right, we got to – I remember you coming up to me and remember what we talked about. And I was like, yeah, I, I, I will, but can't promise anything. And all I remember is you turning and leaving your feet. I'm like, oh, God, what is about – like I've, I've actually <laughs> – more than I never saw you <laughs> jump before. So when you jumped, I was like, do I let him land? An ankle could go. What are we going to do? So no, You I grabbed caught, me, man. I caught you. You, you caught my upper like hamstrings right below my buttocks. <laughs> and the and next thing I know – horrible. Um, this is Monday Night Football, too, if I'm not mistaken. It's oh, like, I forgot. You know, Monday night. So I'm like, all right, there's a thousand cameras in this place. All right, I caught him. Next thing I know, I feel <laughs> your legs <laughs> wrap around my waist as if I'm, like, hugging my wife. This is wrong. And your legs wrap and your ankles lock behind me. I'm like, oh, gosh, Mort, it's, time, it's over. Get off me. Get off me. I didn't feel it was over. I felt we had a moment there. <laughs> we did. We did. But <laughs> – it, it was weird. It got weird. You know, I actually have seen some gifs of of me dry humping you while you were embracing me. I'm just going to – I mean, I have to say, are, it's out there. I have – no, I, I believe it is. With that, <laughs> yes. But I got to say one of the coolest things, though, was to get like an 8 by 10 photo of that, and you signed it and personalized it. Man, I have it framed. It's up on the wall here in my basement. Yes, I mean, yes. it's. I mean, it's honestly for me. It's like God. I was a part of history. You know, I was a part of the kick for you and your yeah. illustrious career. So I was honored to do that. So the fact that that was the celebration, I own it. It's one of my three famous stories of more my time with Morton Anderson. <laughs> I got to hear the other two, <laughs> just to 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 fill the listeners in. What we had planned during the week was the lighting of the cigar. I think you were going to light my cigar and I was going to, and then we were going to do a cell. I was going to light yours and then we we're going to do one of these, <laughs> you know, celebratory things. And that all went to hell. I mean, that, 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 that plan went out the door. <laughs> where, so where does this rank in you? I mean, you've had some big moments in 17 years of playing. Does that, do I make the top five? Do we make the top five together in the history uh, of the game? I mean, leading score, well, I know, I know, of course, you're going to lobby on your behalf. The more I ponder and think about it, but I have to say, uh, top, top top ten, ten. top ten, okay, top, top ten. ten. So you want to give me your your top? Okay, so give me the other two Morton Anderson stories that you have. Okay, you well, the first one, one was basically my first like true meeting of you. I'm on my couch. It's week three, I believe, a yeah, Tuesday afternoon, day off, about noon. I get a call from Jim Mora, who is our coach. Shabby, what are you doing? I'm like, I'm just I, – I probably told him – I didn't tell him I was on my couch. I probably told him I was watching film or something yeah, like that. I'm chilling out. I'm right? preparing for the game. <laughs> uh, <laughs> back when they gave DVDs for you to take home of the next opponent. Right. But I got a call, and he goes, what are you doing? And at the time, I was holding. He goes, well, we're, we have Morton coming up um, to kick in the, in the barn. Will you come up and hold? Yeah, sure, no problem. I'll be there in about an hour. He goes, I'll give you 100 bucks." Great. Sure. I shouldn't say that. It's probably they're going to go back and look at salary cap violations and stuff. But I get there and I, I got I have to tell you, this is true story. I did not know you were left footed. I didn't. So I, you're like, oh, shit. I hadn't really paid attention in the years prior to who kicks with what foot. Sure. So, and we had a rookie long snapper who at the time I was still trying to learn. Get used to catching his. Was that Coons? Coons? It was, it was uh, Boone Stutz. Boone Stutz, right? Oh my god! And uh, I, that name just hit me as you were saying that. I don't think if you asked me five minutes ago, I would have. Boone Stutz, but good move, good call. He threw howitzers back there, and it was enough. Oh my god! And like on the right side, 
And I remember getting down and you look like, you looked at me and were like, whoa, big fella. I'm, I kick with my left. And I was like, oh. and I, I, I knew who you were. I'm like, oh crap. I just, I'm, I'm an ass. And so uh, I, I flip over and I've never, I've never <laughs> held a, a kick for a left footer. So everything's backwards, right? It's like switch hitting in baseball. Yes. And so I had to get a couple snaps and you're, you're all loose. You're like, I'm ready to go. I can't wait anymore. I'm like, I don't want to make, the 60 year old man, like, wait for me to you know, be ready. Hey, 46. I'm allowed, 46. I'm allowed to embellish. 46. Okay. No, oh, yeah, you were. Uh, so I get okay. down and I was used to putting like two fingers on the ground for the spot. And I remember putting those down there and you go, wait a minute, where's the spot? No, no kicker. And I'd held at that time for like four kickers going back to college had ever said that. And you said, which finger? And I said, well, it's right there underneath both of them. And you're like, no, no, I, 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 I need one. And I said, okay. So I put my middle finger down on the spot and you started laughing. That was a good icebreaker moment. You laughed and said, you little, you little whatever. And I said, all right, let's go. And then, and then you kicked like three and you're like, I'm good. And Jim was like, let's go sign. And I was like, thank God I have more time now before Sunday to get used to holding these. But that was my story for, that was my. Uh, I love that story. Um, I do remember the two fingers because I was very particular. Yeah. And did you, were you dreading this job? Because at the time we had Michael Vick, and uh, you were clearly, you know, you were a solid backup. That's not, not the fact your whole career, obviously. But at the time you were, I mean, you had some extra time, a little bit extra time to spend with me. Were you dreading this job going, oh, man, I've got to help for a lefty and live bullets. And I got this guy firing these missiles back there, you know, which we had to work with him to take some of this juice off. He was way too fast. I mean, well, way too hard. Yeah. And it, and the laces were all over the place. Right. So there yeah, was, still, there was a lot of turning to get the laces out of the way. Yeah, and there, was so, a lot of them. there was a lot of moving parts and, and I did not dread it to answer your question. Honestly, I had held going back to college. So being a quarterback, I like to be in control, right? I want the ball in my hand. I want to be able to have those things to be at my disposal, but so I didn't yeah. dread it. Did it make things a lot, a little bit more work? Yeah, I mean, I'm not going to lie. Yeah, we had to work and take a lot of snaps, just me and him and you watching and not necessarily kicking, but just getting the, the procedure right. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I looked at it as like, man, this is this is an honor. This is fantastic. I mean, I get to hold for Morton Anderson, who's I already I knew, hey, he's in three months, he's going to be kicking for the all time scoring record. So, man, I looked at that as a, a challenge and an awesome opportunity. I didn't dread it. Maybe for a couple of days, I might be lying for a couple of days. It's like, Oh God, we have field goal period today. It's like Thursday. I was I demanding. I was demanding a shit. Well, and that's what made you great. And that, that is what makes all the greats great, right? They demand and have high expectations and they want things a certain way. And so we, we did our best to try to make it that way for you. And so I, I didn't mind you that. Did. Yeah, you did. You gave me a nice fluffy ball to hit, and it's it's so important to have that ball sit there, even for one tenth of a second. We were very fast, Matt. We yeah. were like one one five to one two, and normally guys have one three. We were so freaking fast that it gave us that extra time. And yeah, you were your hands were great. I mean, you had great hands, so you were able to get it ball down. Now I'm looking at the ball as I'm coming because I'm coming when the snap's coming. I'm coming. Yeah, and hopefully it's a perfect meeting there in the middle at that moment of truth when the plant foot hits the ground. Right. And I thought you did a really good job, man, uh, having that. been thrown to the wolves a little bit, you know? No, I appreciate that. That's that, that means a lot coming from you, but you're right. I mean, cause you, you, you were fast. I mean, he was fast, fast you, were, but fast. you were quicker than any other kicker I had been a part of, which, which is what, I mean, very rarely ever had anything get close to being blocked because of that. We did, I don't think we had anything. So, all right, that's story number two. You you had you said you had three stories. Oh well, yeah, the story number two was that we went to New Orleans, I believe, pretty quickly there, and we played down there in uh, post Katrina. Post Katrina, I believe, was that the game? The first game was that the yeah it was Monday that, night. Monday night. Yeah, that's right. That was the game with the the blocked uh, punt, and they scored, like, and the place was bonkers. I mean, that was the loudest stadium I've ever been a part of, but. I just remember after that game, you know, it was a, I was in my third year. So, yeah, I was a young player and I was just going to get on the bus, 15 minute ride to the airport, no big deal. And you just said, hey, get on the back of, I forget what bus, just come back on this bus with me. You know, you had your 
I got to tell you, I don't know how family friendly this, I'm sure it is, but hey, you had a bunch of beer, right? And uh, from the equipment guys, and you had your radio show you were on and you said, come on back, have a beer with me. I'm like, all right, no problem. So I remember having one and like I'm 25 years old. I'm still kind of right out of college, so I can drink some beers. And I think you're already like seven deep and I'm only done one. And I'm like, oh my gosh, we only have a 15 minute ride. And I think you finished almost 12 on that ride and you're like perfectly fine. Didn't even phase you. I'm like, this guy is a legend more than just kicking the ball. This isn't <laughs> making me sound like an alky man. Jesus. No, but I, I'm probably, I'm no, I'm everyone knows I'm, I'm probably Maybe a six belching a little bit, but at the time it felt like, cause I knew the airport's right down the road from the stadium, from the city. So it's not far. And I'm like, Oh my goodness! I, I can't. I can't keep up with this guy. He is legendary status. It was a little dehydrated from the game, you know. We uh, <laughs> standing on the sideline. You know, they had the temperature turned up there in the in the super. It was hot. It was humid. It's humid down there, you know. <laughs> oh man, I appreciate you giving me some perspective on uh, on our our defining moment together, Matt. Um, well, I hate to leave off on that one. I mean, I wish I would have went in the other order so I could end it on like. No, that's fine. It is what it Cross is. The legs. I own. Legs. Listen, I own my life. I own my uh, career. Um, we. There was always tradition. I always sat in the back of the bus. That was normal. Uh, I would. I did it in New York, Kansas City, everywhere I went. Yeah. All the vets were in the back, and we'd sneak a beer too. Hey, Bump Phillips in the '80s would have beer for us on the plane. It'd be that's in the seat waiting for you. I mean, and a couple of minis, you know. I love that. I mean, I, I, I often met Ryan. Why hide it? Why hide it? Oh, a hundred percent. You grow men. Right. And, and Matt Ryan and I often said that we, we were in the wrong era of football. Like, you know, yes, the money, like some of that stuff that comes with it is what it is. Yeah. But man, I, I, we see the pictures from like half times and there's beer bottles at halftime or people smoking Dude. a cigarette in the locker. Oh. And it's like, man, this is like, I should have been in this era. Listen, I, my, my locker mate was Kenny Stapler. Okay. So, do I need to say anything else? <laughs> I mean, that come on, the snake. Yeah. And, and so, you know, the snake. I uh, liked his uh, Jack Daniels Black Label, and I remember we played a game up in New England. We stayed at John Meekham's hotel, the Fontainebleau. They, they were all suites, the hotels. My room. I was a rookie, nineteen eighty-two, and I remember my room was right across from uh, from the snake's room. I get a phone call. Hey, Martin, come on over. This is like, you know, 10 o'clock at night. Meetings are over. Curfew's at 11. So I'm like, it, it's the snake, man. He's I'm being summoned by the snake. I, I have to go. I have no choice. Now, I'm 21 years old. So I go over there. There's a black label Jack Daniels bottle and two glasses. He goes, come on, let's, let's go. And I'm like, I mean, I've got a noon kick. We got a one kick, one o'clock kick, right. and it's a snowstorm outside. <laughs> so I mean, I partake. I don't. I don't remember for how long. I remember curfew came at eleven. Guys peeking in. He sees me and Kenny. Go, All right, not too late, boys. That was it. Let's, let's so be. we <laughs> we had a few, and I I I stumbled to bed. And uh, the next day, I mean, Kenny was laying on his back. I think he, he knew it was very hard in the snow to throw the ball forward. When you're laying on your back, they won <laughs> seven nothing. But anyway, that's my one of my Kenny Stable stories. Oh man, Un unbelievable man! It was a different yeah. time. It was just a different time. Sure. All right, let's talk Texans because you spent some of your formative year. I mean, you started. You were drafted by the Falcons, and in the third round, in ninetieth pick, I think, and and you know, spent your first stint with the Falcons anyway, uh, mostly as a backup. But you go to the Texas, and uh, you really – you I mean, you threw up some huge numbers. Still have, what, the second most passing yards in the game? Is that right? I do. I'm tied with uh, tied with Warren Moon. Tied sure. with Warren Moon. Yeah. yeah. So 520-some yards? Yeah, something like that. 520. Unbelievable. I believe, yeah. So current day Texans, Deshaun Watson, how they've handled that whole situation. Have you been following? Do you have an opinion on Deshaun and how that thing is flushing out? You know, I think I've, I mean, just li like anyone, I followed it when it first came out. But, later, yeah. you know, I think it's just kind of fallen 
out of the media cycle, so to speak, until something new happens. But no, I haven't really followed it. I, of course, I follow the league and the teams and all that. So I followed the organization, just having been a part of it and knowing a lot of the people that are still a part of the Texans organization. But as far as that specific situation, I've kind of lost sight and track of what's actually happening. Yeah, I just wonder if you had a, a take on how the organization handled that whole debacle. Um, it seems I mean, I, yeah. weird. It's very weird. I Everyone handles things, things differently. I don't think that it was necessarily handled the best way. Um, mm -hmm. Obviously, they were hamstrung a little bit salary cap wise on what to do with him and his yeah. number. So the logistics of that, I don't necessarily know the specifics of. But yeah. how if they handled it the proper way, I it's hard to say. I mean, their their roster was um, was built a certain way, and without him, you know, they didn't have much firepower to to make no. things happen. Especially after you know that build up in that season where I forget what it was the year before when they lost to the Chiefs and they're up twenty four to nothing there, and the Chiefs come back and and win. It's like that was after that. I mean, that team was built to win right then, but then things kind of collapsed on them salary cap wise. Do you have a relationship with Deshaun? Have you kept in touch with him at all? No, no I, I don't have any. You have nothing there, right? Yeah. Texans fired David Culley after going four and thirteen during his first season. Um, I mean, you watch the team a little bit, right? You see that they were actually kind of scrappy and played a lot better than their record showed. I thought. Um, yeah, yeah, I agree. Why, you know, yeah. Why would the Texans move on from a guy who clearly the locker room really was rallying around? Yeah, you know, watching them and, and seeing scores and some of the, the box scores and highlights, I felt their defense tried to hang in there. I mean, they've got some decent players and some young players that can play. And so I thought they kept themselves in some football games, right, and and were pretty scrappy, like you said. And I thought their young quarterback from Stanford was at Davis Mills. I felt he, he came mm -hmm. in and he, and he manned the ship and he made some plays when they were needed to be made. Um, I think there are ways to go with talent, but, you know, I – one one and done for a coach is unusual. You don't see that unless there's a lot of other stuff going on off the field or things going on behind the scenes that no one knows about. But in all the things that I know and I've heard with David Culley and his experience as a coach throughout the league, I mean, he's a great guy, great man, and a good football coach. I wasn't intimately in the locker room, so I don't know what was right. going on. But if you just go by what goes on on the football field – I don't necessarily believe that there should have been a, that anything warranted a firing um, to move right. on. You know, if, if you wanted to move in a different direction, I guess, but that just shows that there's some dysfunction on the direction of the organization as a whole. Um, generally, when you have a first year head coach, well, okay, you need, you need two, three years to be able to get your guys in the building, right. And try to fix what went on and forge a new path forward and to not afford him that opportunity. You know, it, it it's sending the wrong message. I had Ed Reed on the show some weeks ago. He was very critical of the Houston Texans, uh, mostly about the culture down there, uh, about it being really? uh, this old school, Southern, old fashioned. Um, and I think he was talking about the administration, maybe even right. all the way up to the ownership. And he was just very critical about, he didn't yeah. feel that there were good, good people in the organization. And of course, it's a tough question to pose to you because you spent a lot of time there and had some success there and sure. um, you may see it from a different lens uh, perspective, well, but you know, I can just to comment, like I know Ed, Ed was there for one season. He came from Baltimore and we were teammates for one year there. And, um, you know, just speaking from a perspective of being somewhere a long time and then having a change for a year somewhere else, you would, in, innately you have an idea of how things should go and how you operate right as in, in talking about ed reed and like how he goes about his business or how he prepares or practices or how much time on the practice field and you're you're very particular right and so i can see where you know when some places want you to go about your business or try to do things a certain way but you're used to doing, doing them another and having that yeah. you know leash let out so to speak um mm -hmm. You know, I think that that's that can be tough. So I, I don't know if that's where it's. And Ed, Ed came to us, and he kind of got nicked up in training camp and missed some time. And then, you know, obviously trying to get a guy like that on the football field because he was a big piece to what we wanted to try to accomplish on the back end of our defense. So um, I, I, 
everyone has different experiences and relationships with people. So, yeah. you know, I mean, that's his take. And I'm, I'm, yeah, there was probably some people that were like that, but as far as things that you go on on the day to day with coaches and players, I felt we had a really good situation going. Yeah. You mentioned David Mills. Um, he's, is he a, like the long term, long term guy? Do you think? Do you see him as as you know? He could be. A guy? He could be. Um, I you think see, you know you know a quarterback you know a quarterback play and what it takes. I mean, have you seen yeah. enough from that guy to say he's? You know, just watching highlights because that's kind of that's hard to watch because you only see the good, right? I haven't watched, right. I haven't studied film and studied them or watched a couple games to get a feel. Mm -hmm. um, There's, I mean, there's less than a season of tape. Kinda I think hard, could yeah. be. I think I think you get into the right guys around him, right? A good offensive line, a good running big running game, a good defense. You know, you can and the right coach, right? The right system. Yeah, I think you can be successful with him. I, I don't know yet. I think that remains to be seen. Who do you think the Texans should pick with the third overall pick in the draft this season? Do you have a take on that? Mm. Honestly, I haven't even looked at who the top 20 <laughs> projected guys are in coming out. I don't think it's a strong draft necessarily. Um, There's not a bunch of guys that just pop out at you. Yeah. I, to be honest, and I don't know how many picks they have. Um, yeah. Because I think there's a lot of holes, and I think they need a lot. So maybe if there's not – to me, without knowing their roster, without knowing their situation and their contract situation going forward, you can never have enough guys that can rush the passer and and up front. I mean, you win in the trenches. You win from the inside out. So to me, you got to be able to mm -hmm. win up front on defense and be able to block the guys that obviously teams are trying to rush your passer and disrupt your backfield on the other side. Um, that being said – I don't know how many of those are out there and if any of them jump off the page at the third pick. Sometimes, hey, trade back to 10 or the early teens, get three more picks throughout the draft and build your roster with yeah. all, with a lot of draft picks. Yeah, I would say this. When you have a young quarterback, always good idea to have good line play. Protect that guy, man, so he can sling the rock. I know That's Jacksonville's good. in that situation. Cincinnati Bengals were exposed big time in the Super Bowl on yeah. that right guard, right tackle. Good grief. That was hard yeah, to watch. They need, they need that to was hard to watch. By the inside of that pocket. Ooh, that was hard to watch. And, you know, you, you've been in that pocket. And when you see that thing collapse, I mean, and let's face it, you weren't the most fleet of foot. No. But you still. But, you know, you, you feel you feel you sleep really well at night knowing if you got a, a you know, in your case, the left tackle, right? That blind spot's covered up. But yep. really that you have good, solid blind play. Yeah, just have the edges protected and just be able to have enough up front in the interior to be able to step up. And if you have to reset and go to your number two or number three, you're confident that you're you're able to do that. And yeah. I mean, you've mentioned the Cincinnati Bengals. I mean, look, they got to the Super Bowl and got to where they did and how many sacks they gave up on that run to the Super Bowl. <laughs> I think game. nine, what, nine against uh, um, Tennessee? Correct, correct. Seven and, against the Rams? I mean, it's, in, it's incredible. Or Kansas so, City? It was crazy. It's just you, with their weapons, mm -hmm. you got to be able to solidify those couple of spots. And I mean, you're they're poised to win for the next 10 years. So, yeah, they look good. And um, let's talk a little Falcons. Uh, you retired after the 2020 season, uh, last five years in the league. This was your second stint with the Falcons. Um, you spent with the team your last five years. So you're familiar with the current state of their roster and organization, probably more than the Texans, maybe. Um, I don't Is that true? Not, yeah, not that you absolutely. don't know what's going on. Being um, that that's where I finished up. Yeah. I, I know it right on. So, you know, seeing how the team ended things in the last season and watching the Falcons play, how close is this team to being a playoff caliber team again? A lot closer than probably a lot of people on the outside think. Um, you know, given what what they finished seven and seven and ten this year, is that what it was, or eight or eight and nine, something like that? Yeah, around five hundred, a little below five hundred. Yeah, you know, I think given given their roster and and what they were working with offensively when Calvin Ridley went out um, and some of the injuries they sustained there, I mean, they they did a lot better and maximized what they had with the transition of system and organization. 
defensively, I thought they played very well. Um, you know, and then they can always use more pass rush. That's something that's been the case for the last few years. You need to have yeah. more guys up front to be solid against the run. But then mm-hmm. when you have to rush the pass, you got to go get it. And uh, but you look at the state of the a- NFC South, and with Matt Ryan, assuming he's going to be the quarterback next year, mm-hmm. um, and man in the ship, and you have a running game. If you can get Corderell Patterson, Patterson back, who was a oh man, football guy. I mean, what a great pickup for them last year. And Mike Davis, a running back. Kyle Pitts coming on as a tight end slash wide receiver. If you can just get that wide receiving core back. Um, But you have a guy like Matt Ryan who knows how to manage football games, knows how to go out and win, and knows how to um, play the game. Um, He can win in this division right now. And you look at what the Saints are going through offensively. You look at where the Panthers are, and they're they're kind of – hovering, I guess you could say, and stagnant. And then you look at Tampa, and they're a good football team on the defensive side, and they have weapons offensively, but what are they going to be without Tom Brady? So, I mean, that division is kind of in flux right now, and I think the Falcons are a lot closer than most people think. Um, Again, just addressing two things, you know, some holes in the roster, and then the salary cap situation going forward. I think they're very much in the mix. Yeah, the the division is wide open. I think Tom will re-sign with Tampa, by the way. You think so? I'm kidding. (laughs) (laughs) Why the hell would he? Exactly. No, why would he? Once you're out and you get a little taste and you have that thought and it's put out there, and I I think it's hard to say, you know what? I don't know. I mean, when you came back to the Falcons on your second stint, uh, was there a time when you say, I'm done? But then, oh, man, you know, there's a couple of million holding a clipboard and I can play. I've been a starter. Yeah. And you I know, don't mean it, it disparaged me at that, all. I never hit that point um, until I knew I was done. And my last year, the 2020 year, yeah. um, you know, going into it, I had signed a one-year deal um, yeah. going into that season. So I knew in my mind um, that it was going to be it unless things just totally – because I also knew where the team was, right, and where Matt was mm-hmm. getting to in his career. So they were going to have to, you know, understand mm-hmm. that having a f- almost 40-year-old at that time backup quarterback – to a 35, 36 year old quarterback. I mean, that wasn't a realistic thing, right? They were going to have to find the next guy. So I don't know. I was 48, bro, when I stopped. I mean, it was realistic for me. I know it's a kicking, but hey, I, I get it. But I, I was also in a, in the boat. I want to do. I want to play as long as I can, but also go out on my terms and not have someone tell me you're done. So I knew going into that year, but I, I refrained until the end to make that known. Um, yes, but it's a yeah, hard I, I never, move. Before that, I never had that thought of you know, and I'm done. I'm done. I don't want to play. So hard to do that, you know, as an athlete, it really is. People say, "Oh, well, you, you're gonna know when it's time." No, I, I, I went out of my terms, kicking and screaming. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. I'm thinking, oh, there's a there's a little water left in that turnip. In 2008, <laughs> now I was gonna be 49 when that season ended. And man, there was not two to tango on that one. It was oh. over. So I'm I'm glad you kind of it, it was there a moment that clarified it for you? Or was it a gradual, hey, one year deal? Here we are. I'm I'm turning 40 here shortly, and the, the party's over. Yeah. Was yeah. it physically? Physically? Physically, I didn't hit that part physically. You know, because nowadays with training camp and it's it's not training camp as you and I both know. If no. By I mean it's um you know, I never hit that point physically. And obviously I was backing up. So, I mean, the daily week to week was not overly strenuous, right, physically. But um, I think the time for me was when I realized, so obviously that season when Dan Quinn got fired and Raheem Morris took over as the interim and the whole organization, you know, you could see it coming, was going to be in flux, right? A new new regime, a new coaching staff, a new everything, the uncertainty of who that's going to be and will they be in li- aligned with me being that guy backing up Matt, obviously they're going to want to have a certain control and direction of that position. It's the most important one on the football field. So, you know, it was me being realistic. So it was probably at that point I was like, you know what? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be done. After yeah. That. Is Matt Ryan a Hall of Fame quarterback? Yes. Yes, I believe so. And I, yes, people will say, well, you played five years with him, so you're biased, right? But I look at it for what he did throughout his career from stepping into day one, taking over the organization and the franchise and what he's meant to them and what he's accomplished on the field throughout that time. 
Um, other than holding up the Lombardi at the end of the day, you know, that's the only thing that's holding back probably that conversation for a lot of people. But in my estimation, Mm -hmm. what he's done at the, at that position and a lot of the years of him playing with an average to maybe even below average defense and average Mm -hmm. to below average running game, you know, some of those years with Mike Turner, um, you know, when, when Julio came in the league and Roddy was at the other side, you know, they had a lot of firepower and they ran the football and Tony Gonzalez in the middle, but a lot of the time he didn't have a a real strong run game, right. And defense to go with it. And he had to throw it and he took a beating and and stood in there. And so you just look at what he did and he is a hall of famer in my opinion. Does he have enough left in the tank to get Atlanta back to the Super Bowl? If some of those pieces that you talk about uh, get, gets, that gets fixed, a pass rush or these type of things. Yeah, I, th- I definitely do. You know, obviously it's got to happen here pretty quick um, yeah. in the short term, and they got to get those things. While a lot of pieces are already in place, they need to yeah. find those other pieces to add to the puzzle. But I believe he can because he knows how to play the game and he knows how to, you know, he knows how to win close games. He knows how mm-hmm. to win the fourth quarter. And he yeah. he's not going to lose you football games, which is, which is huge. Do you think um, – he would go play somewhere else after the 23 seasons. His contract expires after 23. Do you see him in another uniform or do you think he'll step back as a Falcon there? You know, I don't know. I, I think, you know, there depends on the teams and who's, who's out there in the market. Who's, who's looking for a guy yeah. Um, yeah. who's ready to win now. Is there a team out there that the only missing piece is that position, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think he would go somewhere else if if twenty three was his last year here, if that his contract's up and and that's it. But you know, he'll always be remembered, obviously, as a Falcon. But yeah, I mean, I think in this day and age, you want to keep playing, and you know, he takes care of himself good enough that he probably has four, four, some more, four or five more good years in him. Um, so we'll see. But I, I could see him going somewhere else. You were you were part of a great class in 2004, Eli Manning, Ben Roethlisberger, Phil Rivers, and they became starters. And it took you a few more years. Was it how frustrating was it for you to see these guys flourishing and out of your draft class, or knowing that you could be successful, right? You would, but you still were relegated to to you know a backup role at the time, and then holding holding footballs let me clarify <laughs> in in my intro i said holding balls we were of course talking about footballs <laughs> you know it was uh it wasn't hard because you know obviously it was a it was a dream that just get drafted right and then be a part of the nfl and, and play this position so i understood my role obviously i was going to a football team that had an established starter i mean at that time i was backing up one of the top five most visible athletes in the world in mm. my so for me, I looked at it as let me learn as much as I can, understand the position at the NFL level, get as much knowledge as I can to be prepared when I did get my opportunity to a, be a starter or just get on the field with the Falcons. And I was afforded a ton of time in the preseason, mm-hmm. which gave me a lot of film to get prepared for how to operate in games at the NFL level, but also the way Mike played, there was a lot of games where I got a drive here, you know, quarter here or there, and then I got a couple starts. And so um, that gave me a lot of foundation to use when I did get my opportunity with the Texans. So uh, this is a question. I don't think you've been asked this a lot, but um, because Mike was such a, you know, he was the original guy, right? Almost mm-hmm. when we had Cunningham. He was a, he was a very versatile, you know, run pass option. Mike was very, and you, you know, I think it's fair to say you were a pocket passer, uh, yeah. tradi- traditional pocket passing quarterback. Mm-hmm. So in meeting prior to games, of course, you never wish anybody to get hurt. Mike did right. get hurt on occasion. How was that strategy and planning? Because you kind of had to almost have two, not two offenses, but two systems, one for Mike and one for you. Is that accurate or am I, is this Am I being a little crazy? Well, no, I think the way we ran the football with Warwick Dunn and TJ Duckett back then and, and Mike's ability to create, you know, I think when I got in there, yeah, there was probably one or two called quarterback runs that weren't called for me. But as far as the generic pass game play calls that Greg Knapp brought over from oh, Sam. The Napster, man. Exactly. When he he brought him over, like the West Coast, quote unquote, West Coast system, yeah. um, it was very similar. It was just how it was operated. And Mike was 
a lot more fleet of foot. So if one or two, one, one, a one B and his progression wasn't open, he would make something happen. I was more, Hey, let me go to three or my check down. Let me work through my progression sure. um, and let those guys go. So it was just a different way, how the progression would end in your past concept. So for me, it wasn't, there wasn't two systems. It was just some of the run game calls or certain first and second down play calls that were called might've been a little bit different, but Again, plays look good on paper. Mike made them kind of have extra credit. Well, you did. I mean, you did have a draw to win a game one time, a three-yard draw. I did. I did. Oh, and and you on. know what? There were some game four-minute uh, situations. No time left? What? Come on. No, it's no time left. Threw it against the wall. I mean, I had a couple of quarterback draws, you know, because they'll never expect it, right? Look at, look at me. We go in an empty set inside the five-yard line. If they want to play that double coverage kind of zone, uh, you know, defense down there inside the five that gives us a five man box to run the ball, and so it's easy. Were you excited when you called that play? Were you like, Yeah, I was, I'm, I'm I scoring, was, I'm yeah. scoring because if, if they want to pressure, if they want to blitz, it's one on one, and we have good leverage with the because it's a, it's a run pass throw, right? Or call. So if they want to blitz, and you know, which you're either all or nothing, you're either going to play all coverage, or you're going to blitz down inside the five. If they're going to blitz, we're going to, I'm going to throw it to a little yeah. out and it's going yeah. to be an easy touchdown. If yeah. they want to play coverage, I run it in. So it's a win-win. So when the call came in, I said, we're going to score, guys. It's just a matter of whether it's me or one of you. I love it. <laughs> hey, um, 2009, man, career year for you. Lead the NFL in passing yards. You selected to your first of two Pro Bowls, and you ended up winning MVP of the Pro Bowl that year. What, what about that season allowed you to find so much success? Because you threw the ball for so many yards that season. I mean, legendary, really. <laughs> well, at that, I guess at that time, I mean, now it's like 5,000 yards to throw for that is like a, a cup of cup of tea. But, you know, I think that year is 4,700 yards. I mean, for me, it was, it was cool just to distribute the football to all the guys. I mean, Andre Johnson had a monster year. We had Kevin Walter, Jacoby Jones, Owen Daniels. Our backs got involved. We were really throwing it to everyone. But, you know, we, we had a decent run game, but not – real good and so to, we had to throw it and our defense was you know average middle of the pack and so we had to throw it so it was really cool to be able to you know utilize throwing it to be able to to win and, and move the football so I mean that was that was cool and then to be able to go and play in the Pro Bowl I mean that was a cool experience just to be mentioned in that game and, and play alongside all the guys that you know across the league. I won't keep you much longer, Matt. I know we, we got to wrap it up, but I got a few. Just a Virginia football question. You're a legend up there. Of course, your number seven is retired, um, and your junior year was one of the best seasons a quarterback has ever had in the ACC. So what's going on with the Cavaliers? Only four winning seasons since 2006. They got a young guy now, Tony Elliott, coming in from Clemson. Is he going to bring some of that Clemson magic, some of that sauce to Charlottesville? <laughs> we sure hope so. I mean, he, he's got the pedigree. I mean, he's a longtime Clemson guy. He played there. He's coached there for a long time. So he's got that, you know, championship, you know, aura and, and mantra that he brings in, right, because he's been a part yeah. of his team. So I think – Virginia hopes to have that, hopes that some of that recruiting <laughs> comes up to Charlottesville because that's that's a lot of what college football is about, right, it's establishing that recruiting trail. And so it is. Uh, I think all that he's said and all that he's done so far, I think it's really enthused the program. Now, Bronco Mendenhall did do a lot for it, um, but now with his departure and Tony's, uh, you know, entrance, you know, I think there's a lot of excitement around what he brings um, to the program. And I have a lot of, I have a couple former teammates that are on the staff. So if, if oh, they're cool. excited, I know I'm excited. <laughs> I love it, man. It's always fun to go back to the alma mater and, uh, and check it out and, and see old friends. So good times. Hey, I'm going to end with a little name game. You played, I mean, 17 years. So you played with everybody and against everybody, almost kind of like me. Um, so when you hear a name, you go, oh, yeah, I remember him, you know, or I played with him or I played against him. So whatever comes to mind when I uh, say these uh, names can be a word mm -hmm. or like a little sentence, something that reminds you, you know, that that sums up who they are in your mind. OK, uh, we talked about Michael Vick. I don't think we need to spend any more time on that. <laughs> That's been <laughs> clear that we all thought he was a unique ball player. Yes. Uh, how about Jim Moore Jr. then? 
energetic. He was fiery, man, like his meetings and how he approached practice and everything. I just remember him like he his reference. I think he made it every day in our team meetings that the bag, the ball was a bag of money. And you got to like protect that, it. Man. You got to protect it for your life, whether you're on defense, getting a pick or a fumble or offensively, you have it. It's a bag of money. I love that. Arthur Blank. Stoic. I mean, he was, you know, especially at that time, like for me coming in as a young player. Now I saw him as a young player and I saw him at the end of my career. Right. So uh, but he never changed. And just being around him in the conversations, just when he, you know, he commanded a lot out of the organization and the people that worked in it. And he was a part of it. Right. And he was oh, he was there practice. He was there, you know, at the games. And I just felt like he was really, really a people person. He loved to know what was going on with your family and off the field and the football, he let us handle our football business. The players yeah. and coaches and those that were directly re in related to the, the game, he let us do our job. But he wanted to know who you were as a person and about your family. I think that sums him up really well. Um, Algie Crumpler. Oh, reliable. Crump. You know, Crump was yeah, that guy, Crump you know, especially for me coming in, you know, whether it was in the middle of the game or the couple games that I played and started, you know, he was the security blanket. He was the guy you could always go to and, and turn to for a play. Yeah. Uh, um, you know, I think he was Mike's number one target, too. Really, I mean, I tell people, you know, if Algy wasn't there, you know, obviously if it's one-on-one -on, -one on the outside, you're going to do what you have to do. But zone coverage, it was like, is Algy open? open? No, I'm gone. So, yeah. he, you know, we just knew that that was our guy. Work done. Elusive. You know, work. I mean, the ultimate pro, I, I often say he was probably – I learned so much from him as a young player just from talking to him. He, he was wise beyond his years at that point, and he was just such a, such a pro at how he communicated with you as a teammate, and he was honest with you where you stood with him. You know, they, yeah. I wasn't good enough, or you got to be better here. Hey, good job. Like, he was that presence that you always look to for acceptance, but also – Hey, would I do something wrong or give me some input? He was that veteran leader that you want um, to kind of, as you always hear, hey, latch on as a young player, right? Latch on to a uh, vet and emulate what yeah. they do and learn from them. He was that guy. Yeah, he was the truth speaker to me. Yeah. No filter. If you, you know, he's going to give it to you straight uh, with, with love and respect. You may not like what he says, but it's yep. the truth coming, coming right at you. So I, I agree. Keith Brooken. Oh, tough. You know, he was, you know, yeah, he, he, again, he was one of those guys. He was no nonsense all about football, but he was, he could, he was going to hit you. He was going to run. He was going to do whatever he could to get to the football and he yeah. was going to wreak havoc. I mean, he was the epitome of a middle linebacker. I agree. Patrick Kearney. Oh, my fellow Cavalier. I mean, he, Let's go. and he was one of those guys you wanted to latch on to as a young player. Worked hard, was a pro at everything he did, took care of himself, uh, was always in the gym, was eating right, was studying, maximizing everything out of his his body and everything that he could bring to the game. He brought yeah. he, he got everything out of himself. Roddy White. Well, I mean, Roddy, when we got him, he was a year behind me. So, I mean, he was super talented. I just remember watching some of the things that he did, and he had all the makings of to be the best receiver in the NFL, which he ended up becoming. Um and just getting there and the, you know, establishing that work ethic, you know, took a little bit of time, but he had all the ability and all the talent. Um, and the fact that he was a two time state champ wrestler was uh, insane oh, I didn't, at a didn't receiver. Know yeah. And so, you know, he was f uh, just a physical specimen, right? D'Angelo Hall. Uh, my, my, uh, my Virginia tech Hokie from down the road, same draft class. Um, Super, super talented. Um, the ability for him to change direction and cover, you know, a lot of swagger, a lot of, uh, you know, good player. Really was tough one-on-one -on -one and, and, you know, you yeah. know, really took it upon himself. He he had that ability as a corner, much like a quarterback. If something bad happened, you gave up a touchdown, he could, he could intercept the next pass, right? He was able to have a short-term memory and come right back and say, throw it, throw it my way next time. Uh, yeah. He won't blink. Laurie Malloy. Uh, he was a hitter. He was the thumper. You know, he was he was going to come downhill and he was going to let you know. So you always had a plan when you got through the second level as a runner. Fortunately, I was never in that position to have to take him on. But, oh my you know, he was the leader on the back end. He got everyone lined mm -hmm. up. And so he yeah. was the quarterback of the defense. 
Kyle Shanahan, of course, offensive coordinator in Houston and Atlanta. Yeah. Super bright mind. Uh, one of the best play callers and play designers you're going to find in the NFL. Mm -hmm. uh, J.J. Watt. Oh, again, another physical specimen that just works and maximizes everything out of himself. And, uh, you know, fortunate to have been his teammate to watch him just develop into one of the best defensive players ever. Andre Johnson, who was one of your favorite targets in Houston, yeah. of course. Um, you guys had a lot of, super lot of success. I mean, yeah, yeah, he was just a guy, Mr. Reliable, ultimate pro, would stay after, run more routes, catch more balls. Wanted to be – he was a team guy first, and he just – it was not about stats. It was about winning, and he was going to yeah. do whatever he could to help the team. You mentioned Arian Foster, just a couple of words that describes yeah. Arian. Elusive. You know, he was the – he was the one of the best I've seen at the zone run scheme. Mm -hmm. One cut, get downhill, and just get what you can, make people miss in the hole. Very hard to tackle in the open field. If he – you know, you're not going to tackle him. You might be one out of ten solo tackles in the open field on Arian. Wade Phillips. Oh, he was great. Wade was funny. He was a funny guy, but super creative. But he also – he was creative on third downs, but ultimately he was pretty vanilla in his base defense. He said, this is what we're going to be, but we're going to do it really darn good. And mm -hmm. and we're going to have guys that fit that mold. And he was – he he made it work for a long, long time. From your Oakland and Baltimore, just a couple of guys, Derek Carr. Uh, well, I was he, with him. He was a rookie, and he super. He was very talented, very very good arm, and and super bright. Um, you know, just you knew he was going to be a, a talented franchise quarterback. Khalil Mack. Oh my goodness, a freak, <laughs> freak off the edge. Did not want to have to go against him ever, knowing he was on the outside. Um, just so strong in his ability, his quickness. It was insane. Mark Davis. Uh. You know, I wasn't there long enough to really, you know, Mark was, he's a different guy, but he was, uh, he just was, I wasn't there in a long round enough to get to know him. Yeah, I got you. Uh, John Harbaugh, a little bit with him. Very stoic. You know, that, that franchise has that mold. I mean, they just have a certain way of doing things and John's very stoic and just how he approaches the game and his mindset and how he expects you to play as a Raven. Finally, your second Stint with the Falcons. Uh, we talked about Matt Bryan, Matt Ryan, of course. Mm -hmm. Julio Jones. He was a stud. I mean, he was an amazing guy. Dan Quinn. Maybe a little word on Dan Quinn. Yeah, Dan's super energetic. I mean, he is he is a player's coach. He keeps it fun. He keeps it. He knows when to. You know, he tells you how it is, but he likes to move on when things go bad, move on. Hey, we got the next opportunity. We're going to get ready for this one. Just, he knew how to get you excited for the day on a Wednesday in November or December. You were ready to go to work. Right. And then Steve Sarkeesian. Steve, you know, very smart. You know, he had a tough task to, you know, manage the offense that we had the year before and he had coached mm -hmm. it. So he had to mold himself to what we were trying to do. And, uh, but he's super bright and really came into his own as a play caller. I feel like, uh, Grady Jarrett, man, child, so strong. He's like, <laughs> he's like bowling ball, but he's so strong and so quick. I mean, he's almost unblockable one-on-one -on -one for a guard or center. You have to, you have to slide to him where if he's at the three technique or at the shade, you have to slide that way. Cause he is a problem in the run game. Finally, let's close it out with a listener question from Spencer on Twitter. You ready for this, Matt? Yeah, let's go. When did you decide to come home, come home, and accept your baldness? I mean, I've been this way since I left college or left high school, so it, it's I been the know. same. Honestly, yeah, I, I don't ever remember you being any different. Oh, sorry, I had a little bit. I mean, I had a little bit longer when you know, but it was still the power alleys were still the same back the then. The power alleys, never heard that one. Yeah, it's my left center, right center field gap. So oh, it's man, never I'm, changed. I mean, so it's it's not. I got it going on too, bro. I'm still holding on to the front right here, but I've I've been this way since yeah. since uh, yeah, eighteen. So. So the answer, Spencer, is hey man, it was it was never an issue, and, <laughs> and we've known that for quite a while. I've yep. known something else for quite a while. You, you're, you're a great human, and you were a great ball player for 17 years, man. And I Thank appreciate you. Uh, appreciate you being my teammate. I feel very blessed and very lucky that uh, we spend a little bit of time together, and we no, had a, we too. had some big moments together. We did, we did, and I I, I think about them often.
Can't wait to see you, man. I appreciate you. I lo love you, and I thank you for your time. Likewise. Thanks, buddy.